Good morning. My name is Rodney Hampton. I'm here to talk to you about emerging legal issues uh, tangential to cybersecurity. So first responders, when they go to an accident scene, recognize this concept called the golden hour. And what that means is during the one hour following a tragic event, everyone that touches that victim can have some chance of changing the entire trajectory of whether that person lives or dies or even what their ultimate recovery is going to look like. Now, those of us in cybersecurity, we're not really dealing with matters of life and death, but we are dealing with matters of uh, significant financial impact. Uh, IBM sponsored the most recent uh, Ponymon study that said that the average cost of breach now is $4 million per incident. That's up 29% since 2013. And what that really means is that each of these incidents costs about $158 per lost or stolen record. Um, why is that important? Well, the sooner you discover a breach, and I recognize that most of these breaches are not discovered while they're in progress, but, but there is a chance, right, that you could be on a team that uncovers a breach in progress. Just think about that, $158 per record, per record, per record. So being able to handle an incident expeditiously, that really matters. And another thing that really matters about it is the fact that, um, as we know, as early as 2011, the Sands Institute released a playbook uh, talking about the incident response process, where it breaks down incident response into six phases. The first stage of incident response is actually what takes place before an incident ha happens. It's called the preparation phase. And so you want to be prepared to be able to handle these incidents, because if an incident happens and you're not prepared, it's going to lead to you know, long-term financial impact. Now, my talk today, kind of what gave me the idea about this, a um, couple of weeks ago I was reading a blog by Optiv. Optiv is the largest cybersecurity solutions provider in North America. Did about $2 billion worth of revenue last year. Anyway, on that blog that uh, Optiv provided about incident response, uh, what they said was, the number one mistake the companies make is not understanding their legal, regulatory, financial, and customer and employee information responsibilities. So I understand that the technology is important. I understand that running a SIM is important, getting the endpoints right, getting DLP, all that stuff matters, right? But what also matters is that somebody has their eye on the ball when it comes to regulations and the legal industry and how it impacts you guys. And sadly, a lot of companies that you work for, they don't have a corporate risk officer. They may have a compliance officer, but the compliance officer is multi-hatted or really doesn't get this risk yet. The board may have its eyes on, on the ball. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I talk to a lot of companies in and around Tennessee, and I can tell you it's just now starting to filter down to um, where the board actually gets it, unless they've been subject to a breach. So that's why I'm trying to uh, provide that education to you today. Now, the graph here on the left, this comes from AT&T. I don't know how their mathematics works at AT&T, but I have a feeling that the top two bars, top two bars mean something totally different. Uh, what I'd like you to focus on is the bottom three bars. So how incidents actually come to the attention of most companies, sadly, statistically, most of the time, it's not you that's going to discover it. It's some external entity, like law enforcement, that's going to knock on your door. The last thing you want is FBI, Scott Algenbaum, and his team to show up and go, hey, um, FYI, we just found all your information out on the dark web. Same thing, customer can find out. The customers start to call your customer fulfillment line and say, I'm getting all these fraudulent charges, and the last place where I used my credit card was your store. And then, of course, service providers. Sometimes a service provider finds out about your breach, 
just because they have information about your customers. And I'm talking here about the banks that handle information on behalf of the merchants. So sometimes the banks are aware of all this fraudulent activity and then alert the merchant. The merchant finally recognizes, oh yeah, uh, oh crap, we've been breached. Um, the graph on the right, this is from a much more reputable, much more reputable report. Uh, you've all heard of the Verizon uh, DBIR, Data Breach Investigations Report. This is the data from 2016. That red line uh, that goes here at the bottom, just above 20% to now down below 20%, that's internal. So don't have any illusions about the fact that your team is on it, you get it, because the statistics say otherwise. The statistics say that when a breach happens, you're going to not be the first one to know. Somebody else is going to tell you. You're going to be in a caught with your pants down kind of situation. So just be prepared for that and don't blow that off. The value of preparation is amplified by the fact that the usual way you find out about breach is surprise. Now, a little bit of Monday, or I'm sorry, a little bit of Saturday morning humor. Um, recently there was an incident that kind of, again, emphasized what can happen in the wake of a breach. Uh, a breach is a corporate crisis. A breach is a corporate crisis that requires a communication plan. There was recently an airline company, I think many of you know who I'm talking about. <clears throat> that airline company reacted probably not in the best way possible to a corporate crisis. Their communication plan was not on. There is a gentleman called Victor Chang. Victor Chang is a um, former McKinsey consultant. Uh, he continues to consult on his own. He has this site called Case Interview Secrets. Pretty interesting guy. I subscribe to his blog. In his blog, he went through what happened at United Airlines with their communication plan and what went wrong. And he said, you know, there are three things that a company have to, has to do effectively during a corporate crisis. First, they have to emotionally connect with their audience, you know, their customers, other entities, stakeholders, shareholders, whomever, before anything else. As a matter of fact, he said, when a crisis occurs, people are emotionally outraged because there's been a gross violation of trust and or expectations. Therefore, if if you are ineffective in that initial communication, it's all downhill after that. Second, he said you have to accept full ownership of the problem. Whether or not that problem was your fault, state it's your responsibility and that you're going to fulfill it. He emphasized that later in the blog post by saying, as a leader, oftentimes mistakes may not fully be your fault, but they are fully your responsibility. Is anybody in here in charge of a cybersecurity program for their organization? Raise your hand. Raise them up. Okay. You're responsible. You're responsible. Yeah. Whether or not it's your fault. I know that sucks, but that's, you know, that's, that's the burden of leadership, right? And then lastly, what you have to do as a corporation in response to any crisis is state what you're going to do to fix the problem, explain that you're, what you're going to do to fix it, and then actually follow through. Now, <laughs> I like The Walking Dead. I haven't seen season seven yet, so don't spoil it for me. I like to binge, binge it on Netflix. But this meme, and there was a whole series of memes in the wake of what United did ineffectively with their crisis communication plan. So although I'm talking more about legal issues, uh, I don't want to de-emphasize how having your corporate communication staff lined up with a message, it can be generic, you know, fill in the blanks. We recognize a breach occurred on X day, blah, blah, blah. We're taking X measures to take, have something in the can. You know, don't be making it up the day of a breach or the day after and then having to walk back a statement and then reissue a statement. Because like uh, Victor Cheng said, number one, connect with trust. The first statement out of your mouth, you better be reinforcing the trust your customers have in you. Uh, reputational injury. So this kind of leads into the next thing, right? So one of the major, one of the major aspects of a data breach, there have been studies now that have looked at the few publicly traded entities that have been breached, the effect on their share price. Okay, maybe they take an initial 
nosedive, but they recover. As a matter of fact, Home Depot, I did a talk on that a couple, couple months back. Home Depot, post-breach, if you would have gone all in the day after the breach was announced, you know, put all your chips on red there. Bet your entire life savings on it. 25% return within a year. Their stock went up, 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 up. Same thing happened with a lot of other publicly traded companies. So it isn't, isn't necessarily the market impact that you initially see uh, that tells the full story. It's the reputational impact. And this is really hard to quantify. Um, what, what a UK-based company uh, named, I'll probably mess up the name, uh, but Semaphore, they found that the overwhelming majority of people uh, would not do business with a company that had been breached, especially if it had failed to protect its customers' card data. They said it was actually 86.5%, and that was 2,000 respondents, so it's not like it's a small sample size, right? Now, maybe that's just people in the UK, maybe they're less forgiving than people in the US, but I think it, it's a good data point, right? Ponymon Institute, they came out with a study um, aftermath of mega data breach customer sentiment, and it was the same thing, they said, it's right up there with poor customer service or an environmental impact. Um, and then finally, experts all believe that the average cost of a breach can be reduced if the incident is handled properly. And part of, part of that proper handling, again, goes back to preparation, goes back to corporate messaging, and it goes back to understanding your legal requirements. Now, are there any attorneys in the room? Anybody? All right, thank God. Um, <laughs> I'm the only one. All right. Are there any aspiring attorneys? All right, good. Good. Okay. So I'm not going to actually try and teach you how to be an attorney on TV, right? Uh, that's not the purpose of this talk. I'm just going to orient you to some of the major areas that are, are going to cross your path in the very near future. And the first one, and I love to beat up on this in particular because a long time ago I worked for an insurance company, a large one. I won't mention the name. They weren't in the process, they weren't in this business of issuing cybersecurity insurance, but um, definitely, this is definitely an emerging area of concern for each of you. Um, so let's dig into it. The dirty little secret about insurance companies is that they like to not pay claims. I know that's shocking to some of you. <laughs> they, they really love the premiums, you know. Back in the old days when I was growing up as a kid, the insurance guy would show up, he would take the premium face to face, fantastic, and then people's houses would burn down and you'd never see the guy. Um, that's not to say all insurance companies are bottom feeders like that, but it is to recognize that insurance companies have an obligation to their own shareholders or uh, mutual members that they're going to pay only claims that are legitimate. And if a claim can possibly be disputed, believe me, they're going to dispute it. Um, Sony Pictures Entertainment. This is a sharp guy, right? This was after their second breach. He came out, uh, this is this is the down North Korean hacking incident, if, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, the whole interview movie, I haven't seen that, that yet, don't spoil that for me either. But anyway, in the wake of that breach, he came out there and said, we're good. We have insurance. Everything's fine. This is gonna no impact whatsoever. Um, yeah, we have sixty million dollar policy with Marsh. This ought to be great, right? Well, okay, maybe not, because during that breach, the problem was that they had a number of tier one computing systems. They were fully down for several days. And each of those tier one system, they, they could not do business. They were losing millions of dollars per day. And they had a cap on their liability at $60 million. Um, and then what happens? Uh, breach insurance might not cover losses at Sony Pictures. Um, of course, of course, it's not gonna cover everything. If you're losing millions of dollars per day, and that's not even counting everybody and their brother that sues you subsequent to the breach. As far as I know, Sony Pictures was not made whole during that breach. Now this is a 2011 article. Sony ought to have known better. This is a flashback. So Sony had a previous breach. They had a series of breaches, right? Their first claim that they tried to make against another insurance company, Zurich, under their general liability policy 
was denied. Shocker, right? Zurich said, hey, this breach, we're not responsible for making you whole, Sony, because this policy only covers uh, bodily injury and property damage caused by occurrences other than the kind of cyber insurance or cyber security attack that you experienced. And where did they get that idea from? They got that idea from a much cited case out of Colorado called the uh, Colorado Casualty Insurance Company case. Um, basically, during that uh, case, once again, shocker, an insurance company denied a claim under a commercial general liability policy, and the court sided with them and said that uh, your loss um, is not eligible for reimbursement. So general liability insurance, not going to be enough, which brings, brings us to cyber security insurance, right? So if my general liability insurance won't make me whole, then surely these new policies that are being peddled out in the marketplace will. They're specifically made to cover me. I'm paying you a policy. Why is that, this not going to work for me? Well, okay. There's a gold rush on right now, folks. And there are about 50 insurance companies as of 2014 that were in the marketplace. I think I saw an article this, this year that said it's up to 68 companies now. Um, cybersecurity insurance, not everybody has it yet, right? But there are insurers filling the marketplace, peddling this, not to you, right? They're selling to the CEOs. They're selling to your board. They're selling to your risk officer. They're selling to your attorneys. This marketplace continues to evolve. But what we can say is that it's going to affect you because it's going to end up, ultimately, your company is going to sign up for one of these policies. They will sign up. If you're not already in the 40% of Fortune 500 that has it, you will be. If you're not already in the 29% of U.S. businesses that has it, you will be. And even if you're not in the 25% of small businesses, eventually that market will get saturated too. Uh, premiums right now, I mean, it's just too large a marketplace for them to ignore. They're going to devote tremendous marketing dollars and effort to this. Uh, right now, about $3 billion in U.S. premiums have been realized in 2016. There's a worldwide marketplace for this, and it's estimated to be a $20 billion marketplace. So eight times the amount, eight times the amount of business. These guys want the premium dollars from your company, and they're going to get it because they're going to make good arguments as to why you ought to be covered. Uh, but the problem with insurance companies is they're like a casino, right? The house always wins. Uh, Columbia Casualty Company, we already talked about that a little bit. So what happened back in that case? Cottage, they hired a third-party vendor. They stored PHI. That vendor, they totally screwed it up, right? Data was unencrypted. FTP opened to the Internet. Search engines scraped it. Holy cow. I went to search for my mom's, you know, Website, and I ended up with mom's medical history, and I had no idea she had an STD. Wow, what happened? <laughs> Any, anyway, so the patients, they sue Cottage, and Cottage turns around, they make a claim to Columbia. Columbia denies it, of course. Uh, Columbia says, hey, um, you outsourced this, but you're still on the hook. You didn't take reasonable measures to protect yourself. Uh, no password, no encryption, no money. Um, Everybody's familiar with Willy Wonka. You know this meme. So the other meme up top comes from War Games. The only way to play this game, the only way to win this game is not to play. Unfortunately, I think you're going to have to play this game. So it's, you might as well know the rules. What are the insurance companies going to do? And this is what your corporate counsel, yeah, they're, they're hip to policies, but they may not be hip to cyber insurance policies. Maybe you can help, help them out and have a conversation with them. So let's go through some of the various ways these guys try to avoid liability. One of them is retrospective dating. And basically what that says is most cyber policies are subject to a, um, a date, which means the liability claims such as data breaches arising from events occurring before that date are not covered. And what they do to make it even more sneaky is there are policies that contain language purporting to relate all causative events back in time to the date of the initial causative event. So if there was an initial breach and then the attackers went away and they came back and used the same exploit and hit your customers again, 
they're going to re relate that all back to the original date of the first breach. So your policy date may have gone in force, but it may not cover the event. Uh, next, exclusions. So almost all these policies were written to copy uh, what had already been done with other insurance policies. And if you've looked at any property and casualty policy, you'll see that there's a whole, there's a whole section there about um, acts of God, acts of war, acts of terrorism. All that stuff's excluded from coverage. Well, guess what? A lot of people in the cybersecurity space that are being breached, a lot of the breaches now, uh, as we saw the DNC hacks and some others, Sony Pictures, are sometimes being attributed back to nation state actors. And therefore, if your policy has an exclusion for terrorism or, or act of war, you're not going to be covered. The insurance company is going to say, ah, ah, thanks for the premiums, denied. Um, other limitations on coverage. So, oh, other exclusions. So third-party negligence, sometimes that's not covered. So if you've got a cloud provider, they screw up. Uh, sorry, that was a third party. You're not covered. Some of them have special language around encryption of data. Does it apply to data in motion? Does it apply to data at rest? Who knows? If lawyers love to write, lawyers love to write vague contractual language so that they can make it mean anything. Data not encrypted. Claim denied. Good luck getting money out of the insurance company. Um, and next, there are formal and informal uh, inquiries that can come in from attorneys generals after a data breach. Some of that stuff is not covered. So all that effort that goes into responding to these regulatory agencies to say, oh, hey, heard you had a breach. Um, so we want this from you and this from you and this from you and this from you. And you go, wow, this is going to cost my guys like uh, three full-time employees for 100 days. Uh, let me make an insurance claim. No, nope. denied because your regulatory agencies or, or your own uh, negligence sometimes are excluded from coverage. So just be aware of this. Uh, P.F. Chang's, so I'll give you one. P.F. Chang's, they had uh, $1.7 million they got from their insurer for a post-breach expenses in defense of a class action suit following a 2014 breach, but they did not recover, did not recover 1.9. So you heard that, right? 1.7 they got, 1.9 they didn't uh, because that was for monies shelled out to a credit card processor for PCI DSS assessment, not covered. Uh, limitations on coverage. So moving down to step number three. What do you need to insure against? Insure against everything, right? You want to be insured against the post-breach forensics. You want to be insured against the notification expense that goes out to all of your customers. You want to be reimbursed for public relations expense to rebuild your brand reputation. Reimbursed for business interruptions. So if you're like Saudi Aramco that had to buy every hard drive on the freaking market, uh, because your systems were down. You want to be reimbursed for that. Credit monitoring for your customers, for you to purchase the credit monitoring for your customers, you want your insurance company to be on the hook for that. Uh, legal costs, regulatory fines, all of that stuff. If you don't write it in, if you don't make sure it's in your policy, you're not going to be covered. They're going to deny those claims. Piecemeal, they'll say, this is in, this is out, this is in, this is out. <coughs> Clear enough? Um, moving on, moving on, moving on. Because um, I'm geeking. I did, I have to admit, I kind of geeked out on this part of the presentation uh, because I love to give insurance companies a hard time. Um, <laughs> so, sorry if I'm boring some of you to tears. So, self insurance retention, what's that? So, if I am target post breach and I go out as they did and I manage to get a $100 million policy to cover future cybersecurity incidents, because I'm a little hip to what happens now that I've been breached badly. Uh, the insurance company said, that's great, Target, but uh, $25 million, the first $25 million you pay. Kind of like the deductible on your own auto insurance or health insurance. Uh, they call it self-insurance re retention. I call it, uh, what good is insurance for? Um, premium increases. So because of the complexity in the marketplace, and because over the last, oh, I'd say five years, there's been a real evolution in the threat, right? So even though insurance companies and actuaries thought they had a handle on what the risk is, the risk is constantly evolving. So they don't really understand. It. And because of the number of breaches, you saw the ransomware up, 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 the number of breaches up, 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 the number of claims being made up, up, up. So guess what happens to the premiums? 
actuaries realize, hey, we haven't really accounted for all of the potential costs that we're on the hook for. We're doing the best we can in the court system to deny all these claims, but some of them are still getting through, and we're not able to handle this. That kind of goes back to that. What was it The Incredibles, where Bob was in the uh, insurance company? Bob, you've got to stop these people from making claims. Well, they realize it, right? So they're jacking up the premiums. So even if your company, even if your company is considering not purchasing cyber insurance, what they might end up doing is purchasing just because they look at what the potential increase in premiums could be. So be aware that's going to happen. Uh, inability to get coverage. So funny story, not funny haha, -ha, but funny, this is kind of odd. Lloyds of London said, hey, look at all these risks for the, um, for the electrical industry over here in Europe. Uh, tremendous amount of risk, you guys really ought to buy insurance. And so what happens? All these electrical companies in Europe try to get insurance, and what happens? They can't get insurance. Nobody will write them the policy because the risk is too high. So the people that need, it's kind of like health, which was um, allegedly addressed with the Americans, um, the Affordable Care Act, which we won't go there, but um, sometimes the people that are most in need of insurance are the ones that are completely uninsurable. And that could be your company, unfortunately, if you're in certain industries. And then finally, the way other, other people uh, get out of uh, paying claims, so misrepresentations on your application. The scary part of this, the really scary part of this, is that it doesn't necessarily need to be a material misrepresentation about the thing that you got breached for. So I'll give you an example. So let's say you made a material misrepresentation on your policy application about the state of your antivirus. But the breach that happened was due to a lost laptop that had no full disk encryption. <coughs> nothing to do, nothing to do at all with the fact that you had no AV. Sadly, that material misrepresentation is the basis for denying the entire claim. Doesn't matter that the misrepresentation had nothing to do with what the breach actually, how the breach actually occurred. So. Pretty sad there. And then finally, promissory warranties. What, uh, what insurance companies love to do is say, hey, great, thanks for the application. And oh, by the way, you have a continuing obligation to maintain your security in the state uh, that you told us you had. Otherwise, uh, let us know, right? Because your coverage, we may need to adjust it. So basically, if you drift from what you had on your policy application due to, let's say, a merger or acquisition or a major change, change in technology, et cetera, and then you have a breach, and then you go to be uh, reimbursed, sadly, denied. Denied again, denied, denied. So enough about that. Um, so cybersecurity and insurance, do I think you should have it? If you are a small business, and you don't have any other means of protecting yourself, I think it makes a lot of sense. Small, medium-sized businesses, probably. Large businesses, though, they have the potential to do what's called self-insure, right? They don't necessarily have to self-insure for just a portion of that risk. They can self-insure for the entire risk uh, and take it upon themselves. For example, Home Depot, they could have absorbed the entire millions of dollars of loss from that breach. That did not put them out of business. As a matter of fact, there have been very few cybersecurity breaches that have actually put a company out of business. There was one company up in, uh, I think it was New Jersey. They were a Japanese-owned subsidiary. They got breached a couple years ago. This was at an IANS talk. We went over that. They got breached. It was bad enough. The Japanese company said, ah, we just can't, we just, it just doesn't make sense to even continue anymore. They shut the whole division down. It was gone, off the face of the earth. Uh, same thing happened with another company was almost put out of business. I don't know if any of you went to the uh, ISSA meeting. Might have been a year ago, with uh, might have been two years ago with DHS, and they were talking about um, they were talking about intellectual property theft. There was a small company. They made their software for for PCs to protect PCs from browsing to to bad sites. Chinese got in there, were hacking away basically stole all their intellectual property, rebranded the entire thing, started selling it overseas. The company, you know, sued them to make whole, make themselves whole. Chinese hackers retaliated, almost took that company out of business. Should those guys have had cyber security insurance? Absolutely. Extinction level event possibility, they were small enough, they should have had it. But if you're 
with a large company, maybe those dollars that could be spent on premiums, and it's, it's not a small amount we're talking about, these dollars can potentially be better used on your IT security program. But you've got to have facts. You've got to be able to go in and talk to your risk officer, your corporate counsel, your CIO, your CFO, and say, look, I went to this talk, this crazy guy on a Saturday, he said cybersecurity insurance really sucks, and there were all these times, there are all these ways the insurance company can wiggle out of their obligations. I really think you ought to spend this hundred grand instead of on premiums that are going to just vaporize. Uh, we ought to spend this on DLP or next gen endpoint or something like that, right? So at least maybe you can go and make that argument now. So moving on, we're, we're probably way over time on that piece of it. I did geek out a bit. So this, this emerging legal trend is something you may not have heard of. So California. California loves to regulate. California has an attorney general. Attorney general issued a report, said, look at all these breaches that are affecting California citizens. Hey, guess what? We think that California citizens, there's already an obligation in the law that says you need to take reasonable precautions to protect California citizens against data breach. Guess what? That means to us, SANS critical security controls. You better have a framework and a better apply. Why does this matter to you people in Tennessee? Well, because there's no attorney in the room, I will fill you in. So um, do any of your companies have customers that are citizens of the state of California? <coughs> yes. Anybody have a physical presence in the state of California? Maybe. Well, Californians get around, right? It's one of the most populous states in the union, and sadly they travel all the time, can't keep them out. So they eventually make their way to Tennessee. They probably buy stuff from you. They probably get on your website. Pesky Californians, they're everywhere. Um, you're dealing with California. Civil procedure tells you that if you have continuous contacts with that state, that justifies that state to protect their citizens, can haul you into their venue and beat you up about cybersecurity. And guess what that means? That means you better have a darn framework and a better tie back in some way, shape, or form to SANS critical security controls. Fortunately, they pick SANS, right? SANS has 128-ish sub-controls, not the worst. It's not like they picked NIST 853, which had 700, 800 controls, but you get the point. Better have a framework. Um, anybody deal with New York? This law probably does not apply to you because it only applies to certain entities that are in the financial services in New York. However, here, I'll, I'll skip to the punchline, however, there are lots of state regulatory agencies that like what New York has done here with this law, and they're considering implementing laws of their own. I think Colorado has one teed up right now. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies Division of Securities. They're considering implementing a rule like this that would apply to California companies in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, it's not just it's not just publicly traded companies and financial institutions that are applicable to security laws. A lot of states have their own security laws, and a lot of states have a regulatory agency in charge of those security laws, and a lot of small businesses, they issue securities just in the state, small closely held entities, but you might be working for a small closely held entity subject to state securities laws. They adopt some crazy thing that looks like this New York thing a year from now, and all of a sudden, hey, you're on the hook. There better be a person at your entity that is designated as the person in charge of cybersecurity, a CISO, whether you've got the title or not. And that per the California law actually says the CISO has to talk to the board, which I personally think that's a good thing, but it's a requirement, right? It's not a nice to have anymore. For these people, it's a must have, and I'm telling you, it's coming elsewhere, and it's gonna slowly make its way around to every state so eventually, you're not, going, not only going to have to have a framework, you're going to have to have a CISO. The CISO is going to have to be talking to the board. I personally welcome this kind of, I mean, this is, this is stuff we want, right? We want to be having these conversations. Well, whether, you, if, whether you're in that camp with me or not, you're going to be in that camp eventually. Um, so let's take a step back and talk about publicly traded entities for a second. Sorbanes-Oxley. Everybody's heard of this. Act went in 2002, 2003, I believe it took effect. 
You've got criminal penalties that can affect your, your C-level executives, particularly your CIO and CFO, or if they're signing off on fraudulent statements that are made to, uh, to the SEC. You also had the creation of the uh, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Boy, that's a mouthful. Um, and out of that, what happened was they leveraged uh, the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission, which actually came into effect back in the 80s, uh, to deal with fraud, fraudulent financial reporting. So this accounting oversight board and COSO together, there's a framework of internal controls that are supposed to provide reasonable assurance, right? Reasonable assurance that what appears on your financial statements to protect investors is there because the data all along the way is correct and the people that signed off on it did all the right things and the people that, that had access to the funds did all the right things and you're reporting, you're not making material misstatements to the public so that the investors are protected, right? It's a level playing field in theory. All the investors are protected by SOX so that we don't have an MCI WorldCom or um, who was the other one? It was Enron, right? Enron. So we don't have another one of those come down the pike. And what happens is, Hisaka said, okay, great. We've got this framework, it's called COBIT. Uh, control objectives for information related technologies. Uh, if you're using COBIT, we think that relates back to what COSO has for internal controls. You don't have to use COBIT, but you have to have a framework. So again, it goes back to there must be a framework in place. So if you don't have a framework, pick one. I don't care what it is. ISO 27001, 27002, COBIT, um, SANS, NIST, pick a framework and implement it because you're only doing good things for yourself. Um, SEC, so funny thing about the SEC, they've, they've doubled in size since SOX went into place. And they have their own regulations that they've promulgated to protect, once again, investors and to make sure that uh, these broker dealers, which can be some kind, sometimes a little bit shady, make sure they're doing things that are right, you know, with your money. Uh, which is all, uh, this is all good, right? The, the thing that's happened though recently is that in 2014, they decided to start just, just, we're gonna take a, take a dip. We're gonna take a sample. They took about 50 companies, these broker dealers, these advisory companies, and they said, let's take a look at the state of your cybersecurity. And they peeled back the map. And what they found under the map, <laughs> oh man, this is not good stuff that we found. Um, these guys don't even have the basics down. So what happened in February 2015 is they said, hey, here's another risk alert. Here's what we consider to be the basics. You've got to have governance and some kind of risk assessment. And oh, by the way, they said the same thing. You need a CISO. CISO's got to be talking to the board. You need to have access rights, you know, funny, funny thing, right? You guys need to have some kind of access rights and controls. You need to have some kind of DLP going on. You got to have your third party vendors you got to wrangle them and you got to train your humans because it's completely out of control. So expect that the SEC is going to continue to, to, to dive deeper uh, with the companies that are directly under their control and that's going to have ripple effect everywhere. Basically, basically, if you're not getting the story yet, the story is have a CISO, get a framework, start doing the right stuff, documentation, all that, all that great stuff. So what happens when, when companies that have stocks do bad things? What happens when they make a material misstatement? Uh, well, okay, Yahoo. Yahoo was about to merge with, um, with Verizon. Verizon was going to buy them out for close to $5 billion. Uh, just as Verizon was about to cross the finish line with that sale, uh, we found out that, oh, it was a half a billion records we lost, Yahoo says. Whoops. And then maybe a couple weeks later we heard, you know, it was actually uh, a billion. <laughs> yeah, it's a billion dollars. And Verizon said, well, we're going to write down our, what we think your company is worth by, to the tune of, what's it say, $350 million. Which is not bad, really, when you consider average cost of a breach, uh, average cost per record loss. That's probably, you know, if I got to put, put a finger up in the air and kind of catch the wind and Think about what insurance might cover, what might not. That's a pretty good, pretty good number. So the SEC, of course, says, okay, Yahoo, 
you guys have seriously screwed this up. You've been filing, telling us all these great stories. This breach goes back to, what, 2013? You suck. We're going to investigate you. And then what happens? Yahoo shareholders, they say, hey, whoa, 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 I was about to dump this craptastic sock, right? Because since Marissa came on board, things have not been well. I've been waiting for this white knight investor. I've been waiting for this Verizon deal to go through. I can unload this stock. And now all of a sudden, the rug has been yanked out from under me. My stock is still worth crap. You suck, Yahoo. I'm going to sue you. So another class action lawsuit. This is what's called a shareholder derivative suit. It says that the board of directors and the C-level executives, they have not protected the shareholder's best interests. Why? Because we didn't get our cybersecurity straight and we made material misstatements to the SEC. So bad things happen if you issue shares and people don't like what happens to the price of those shares and they find some way to tie it back to a breach that's happened to your company. Uh, the other lesson learned out of this is that for mergers and acquisitions, you must always, always uh, do your due diligence. I have no idea how this breach came to light. Does anybody remember? I don't. Okay. Maybe somebody at Verizon found it. I don't know. But my guess is that if they were digging hard enough, they would have found it. Uh, any of your companies go through, do growth by acquisition? It's lovely, isn't it? They just take a block, they drop it in, they tell you to connect the network, everything's going to be good. Don't do it. Don't do it, man. Yes? Anecdotally, there is a, a New York Times article that there were security folks within Yahoo constantly going up to, I forget the executive name in Yahoo, but they were asking for additional security tools, they knew about vulnerabilities that they had, they mm -hmm. documented the vulnerabilities that they, that they had or were concerned about. The choice was made at the time because she was under a lot of pressure to continue turning out new products and new technologies to keep the stock propped up. So the choice was made to do more product development yep. and as opposed to actually implementing any, any dollars was the way the article read, was that there were even some basic things that were just overlooked. I know, uh, and I'm pretty down on Marissa. Um, I'm I'm not a Marissa Meyer apologist, so. But I totally get that, right? You're wearing the C-level hat. You're trying to do what's right. Limited resources, yada, yada, yada. But it does go back to slide number three uh, or four in my slide deck where Victor Chang is talking about what happens during a crisis. Just remember, if you're the leader, if you're a leader, you're on the hook. may have been somebody else's fault. Sorry, that's the... That's the price of being a leader. Um, good comment, though. Yeah, I, I think I think you're you're right. I mean, she can't be responsible for everything, but then again, she's responsible for everything. It's kind of a catch twenty two. Um, so, data breach notification laws. I haven't talked about this mostly because it's so well known. So, anybody here a Bama fan? I went to the Ohio State University. I'm going to call you out one more time. Any Bama fans in the audience? All right. Why does your state, why does the state of Alabama suck? Because they're one of the two states, they're one of the two states left that have not enacted a data breach uh, notification statute. Them in South Dakota. So I, I don't know what's up with them, but um, if you see a Bama fan out there, give them some grief. Uh, New Mexico just signed up a couple of weeks ago. So they are the 48th state to be signed on with a data breach notification law. Why does this matter? Okay, so almost all these states have an attorney general. Sometimes these data breach notification laws give private citizens the right to pursue actions against the company, but in most cases it says the attorney general can pursue action against you. So what happens is if there's a breach and you've got customers from all these different states, all of these state attorney generals get on board and say, you know what, I'm a lawyer and I haven't sued anybody today. It's a good day to sue you because you lost your stuff uh, that belongs to my citizens. And we're going to fine you and use that to fund my regulatory agencies so that we can continue to have a purpose in life. Um, the other thing these data breach notification statutes do is there's often a safe harbor for encryption, which is good, right? So if you're encrypting your laptops, you're doing the de if you're encrypting data in in motion and at rest, it, it helps a lot. Uh, many of these states, they have a separate they have a separate statute that deals with uh, social security, so you can get a one-two punch, right? You can get a data breach suit and then also get sued for mishandling social security numbers if you've done that. 
Um, but one of the more interesting parts of it is law enforcement. Um, almost, and we'll just use Tennessee's uh, data breach notification law as an illustration. So almost all of these state notification, except Bama, you know, Bama fans, sorry about you. Um, almost all these state data breach notification laws say you've got to notify these customers. And most of them set the threshold at either 1,000 or 5,000 before the statute goes into effect. So if 1,000 people are breached or 5,000, you've got to do a notification. But they do give you a little bit of a grace period to make a reasonable investigation. They also give you an out, you know, almost all of them, there's an out for law enforcement action. So when, when people are losing their minds and there are already 10,000 consultants descending upon you and vendors are ringing the phones off the hook and you're in the middle of the breach and you go and say, you know what, I think we need somebody else here in the war room to help us. And that's going to be the FBI, the TBI, and who knows, maybe we'll get the Secret Service too because They've got a cyber enforcement agency. So why not? We'll just bring them all in. And people are going to look at you like you've grown a third head. It's already a crisis. Why do you want law enforcement here? Well, law enforcement means that we've got to wait for them to tell us that they're done with their investigations so that we can inform our customers. So if I'm good at clock management, I'm going to call law enforcement because they're already buried and they're a government agency, and that's going to help me delay when I need to do notifications. So just throwing it out there, I'm not saying that's what you should do, but I would. Um, okay. We're really running close to the end now. I think I've got, where's my timekeeper? We've got a few, uh, 12 minutes, uh, 14 minutes. 14? Yeah. Oh, plenty of time. Fantastic. All right. We can, I could talk all day, sadly. Elise knows this. She's been with me. Um, so why are data breach notification statutes also important to know about? Because there are 48 different statutes, and they all say something different. It goes back to preparation, right? If you haven't already downloaded and know what each of those statutes do and how those notifications roll and what you can do with some states and what you can't do and who can sue you for fines and who can't and who can bring you got to know. You got to do the preparation, or hire an outside counsel that has already done this prep work, because when you get breached, you need to know that stuff. Um, second thing about those is that usually what happens during a breach is lawyers, like I said, we're, there, there are no lawyers in the room, so nobody's going to get offended. Lawyers smell blood in the water. Anytime something bad happens to somebody else, lawyers sense blood. They're like sharks. I think that analogy has been made before, but I'll claim it. Um, they will come, they will find what's called a representative that represents the entire class of people that have been breached. And they will file a lawsuit, those pesky lawyers will, and they will drag you into court. And they will try to find everybody and their brother under every claim they can possibly make, which now they've got 48 laws to beat you up with, right? So it's easy to find one person in each state that's representative of the class in each of those states pile that all together, and then because we got so many people, let's have fun. We're not going to do this in all the state courts. We're going to put it together in one big suit, and we're going to file it in federal court where there's kind of an accelerated docket, and things move a little more speedily than all these different state venues. That's what lawyers do. That's what they get paid to do is something bad happens to people, they go to the lawyer, the lawyer takes their little piece of it, and then they give you, you get like a notification in the mail that you get a dollar because somebody lost your personal information, right? And the lawyer gets five million. Seems fair. Anyway, um, so let's look at the, my favorite example here, Target, or not Target, uh, Home Depot. So Home Depot was the largest breach before the Yahoo thing. There was Target. 56 million credit and debit cards lost. Everybody sued everybody. Now, the good thing about these, these kind of data breach notifications and these suits is there's a problem called standing. In a lot of jurisdictions now, they'll say, hey, just because your data was breached doesn't mean that you can show a recognizable injury to the court. Your data is out there, but unless you have experienced fraud as a direct as a direct consequence of this breach and oh by the way you got to prove that it was this breach not not the other two you were subject to if you can't prove that you don't have standing therefore get the heck out of the courtroom 
Well, things were a little bit different with the um, with the Home Depot case, and they're they're different with these PCI cases because, okay, Joe Schmo that gets breached, he may not be able to prove a cogn a recognizable injury to the court, right? But these issuing banks and their banks, right? Banks have a lot of money. Banks have attorneys. These issuing banks that are on the hook to reissue all these credit cards with all the costs attendant to that, they get mad. They get really, really mad at these merchants that lose the data and have blown it with PCI. So what happens? The banks sue or their insurance companies sue, right? Uh, and those cases, they do have standing because they shelled out a crap ton of money to reissue these cards. So that stuff makes it into this wonderful flow chart, which I don't expect you to, don't expect you to learn this today. But the gist of it is, as cases progress through this civil action flow chart, they reach this one stage called 12B motions. 12B motions are an opportunity after a case has been filed for the defendant to basically say, so what? You don't have standing. You don't have a recognizable injury. You don't have this. You don't have that. You've filed it the wrong way. You've, you've screwed this up in some way, shape, or form. We got to get this case dismissed. So a lot of the action that takes place in these data breach litigations occurs around these 12B motions. Because here's, here's the prize, right? If you're the plaintiff who brought the suit and you get past the motion to dismiss, it's fantastic because now you're in a stage of litigation called discovery. And during discovery for civil litigation, everything's game, right? Now I can send interrogatories. Now I can tie up your people with depositions. Now I can, I can request electronically stored information. So your IT guys got to put litigation holds. They got to grab stuff. That stuff jacks up the cost for the defending company so much so that if they lose the motion to dismiss, they settle because they don't want to go through discovery. Because what's on the other side of discovery? Discovery is never going to lead to a good thing, right? You were breached for a reason. Who in here is the golden child IT security manager who gets every budget line approved? Raise your hand. Anybody? Nobody can get everything approved? You're awesome. <laughs> you can. I haven't done it. Okay, well, that doesn't count. So, so what's going to happen during discovery? They're going to find out you made requests for budget. They were for requests for reasonable security improvements, right? And somebody denied them, those bastards, right? They denied your budget. And therefore, you got breached. And the customers, they're on the hook. And the issuing banks, in the case of a PCI breach, they're on the hook. So you're not going to win. And guess who sits on those cases? It's going to be citizens. How many people? So this one, everybody raised their hand. Who? has had their information breached and had a new credit card issue. Or got a notification, everybody, everybody, right? So who's going to be on this jury? All right, put the jury aside. Let's say we do a bench trial. Do you think those judges haven't been breached? Haven't had wives that have been breached? Cousins, sons, daughters, whatever? You're never going to win. So if you don't get the case dismissed, you settle. That's what happens. So that's what that's what all this litigation is about. That's that's civil procedure, right? So 12B is your fire exit. If you don't get out, you're going to burn to death. All right, we're running out of time, and thankfully too, because I geeked out on like the insurance part of the presentation. So I really didn't do a lot of work homework on this section. But just be aware that uh, there are plenty of other regulatory agencies. Oh yes, there are more that uh, want to be involved, and there are plenty of other regulations. So HIPAA. Who in here is subject to HIPAA? Probably quite a few of you. So the Office of Civil Rights, there have been two cases that came down recently. I think it was there was one late in the fall last year. It was the largest settlement to, settlement to date because they brought an enforcement action. It's the same thing, right? If it goes to discovery, you're screwed because nobody approves all the budget. They got breached, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so people settle once again with regulatory agencies. The uh, largest settlement was like for $5.5 million, and there was one that just came out a couple weeks ago that was right up there, it just squeaked in under it. Um, the, case that, the case that had the largest enforcement action, I think it breached three times, right? Okay, you probably deserve to pay a $5.5 million fine. Um, FTC, so the Federal Trade Commission, 
under their right, and this, this one actually kind of makes sense, right? FTC's whole, sole purpose in life is to protect consumers, consumers like you and me, against bad things that happen in the marketplace. Well, so many people have been breached now, the FTC says, you know, everybody in the room is a consumer. We have this wide-ranging power as a concern, consumer protection agency, so guess what? We're involved in cyber now. Over the last year, I've seen at least three, maybe four instances where the FTC has brought action against a company. And guess what? There will be more. And every single state that's out there, they have what's called the baby FTC law because it's not good enough to just have one regulatory agency doing the same thing. Our, our, our country, God bless it, loves to have multiple agencies doing the same thing. So every state has their own little baby FTC agency. They're going to get hip to this too and be like, hey, I can make my budget. How many minutes is that? Okay, great. Um, so the same thing's going to happen. So they're going to say reasonable security measures. Should have framework, should have a CISO, should have been talking to the board, should have been approving all those budget requests. FCC, if you're an ISP, the FCC is now looking at you. There was just a decision that came down. Decision came down a couple weeks ago. Uh, I can't remember the exact entities that were involved. Basically, entity one was an ISP. They outsourced some of their data to a third party. The FCC said, hey, ISP, I regulate you. The third party breached your customer's information. But guess what? You don't get to write off the risk to that. You're still subject to us, baby. Pay up. We are the FCC. You're beholden to us. You can't delegate that risk away to some third party that doesn't report to us. No, no. It's us. Um, CFAT, so Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards. In there, this came down, um, basically critical infrastructure protection post 9-11 occurred. Obama expanded that uh, with an executive order. I can't recall which one. My brain tells me it's 96, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, chemical facility anti-terrorism sta standards. If you produce certain chemicals in a chemical manufacturing process, um, Homeland Security has an interest in you to make sure that those chemicals aren't released into the atmosphere by a cyber event, like Bhopal back in uh, when I was I'm kind of dating myself back in the 80s. Huge event at an Indian uh, plant killed a bunch of people. They don't want the same thing to happen. Uh, now now they have what's called uh, Section 8, uh, cyber security reporting requirements to DHS. Tier 1 and Tier 2 facilities are being audited by DHS as we speak. Uh, the Tier 3 and 4, the people that don't really produce really death-causing agents don't have to worry about this. But if you're in the business of producing chemicals, you may want to check into this and make sure that you're compliant. Department of Transportation, are you transporting petrochemicals? Are you transporting chemicals? Department of Transportation, they've got their own standard. And both of those fall under kind of critical infrastructure protection. They're quote unquote voluntary, but they all say you ought to be using the NIST cybersecurity framework, not 80, 853, but just the large overarching framework. You gotta have something framework wise in place. Merck SIP, same thing, it's part of critical infrastructure protection now. And then last but not least, uh, GDPR, which goes into effect May 2018. So any plenty, anybody that has an entity that is physically located in, in Europe, in the EU, and anybody that processes data that has to do with EU citizens or interacts business with EU citizens, you're going to be subject to GDPR. And GDPR has a wonderful 72-hour notice provision. So you don't get that wonderful law enforcement uh, clock mechanism. GDPR, that's a hard requirement, 72 hours. So if your incident response plan does not account for that and front load that, you had better add it now because the clock is ticking May 2018. Last thing I'll say about GDPR is that um, the whole point of that regulation is about privacy. So if you are retaining information about EU citizens and they want you to remove it, you have to be able to show that there's a pretty darn good reason for holding on to it. Uh, they have the right to consent or not consent. Um, so that's pretty much it. <clears throat> My call to action for you in the final moments is time to act is now. So preparation. Those of you that are IT security professionals, you should go and have a hard conversation. Put it on the calendar now, 15 minutes. Get with your corporate counsel. Get with your outside counsel. Get with your risk officer. Put 15 minutes on the council or on the schedule. 
to go and talk to these people. Because if you don't talk to them now, what's going to happen is during a breach, when everybody's monkey brain is exploding and their lizard mind takes over and everybody's tensions are high, there's going to be a lot of blame shifting going on. Hey, cybersecurity professional, you should have known about this stuff and let me know. I'm not able to keep on top of everything. I got to keep on top of these 30 other things. So go talk to them now. And then finally, extra credit is if you do a uh, tabletop exercise. Navy SEALs have adopted this, uh, this saying that actually goes back to uh, olden days, uh, about the 600s BC, there was a, a Greek poet and philosopher that says that uh, you don't really rise to the level of your expectations, you fall to the level of your training. If you're not doing a tabletop exercise in conjunction with your incident response planning, well, you're kind of failing at preparation. Uh, I would talk a little bit about myself, but uh, forget it. Here's how to reach me on the Twitter, and I will eventually condense this down to a blog article on my much uh, uh, neglected blog. Um, any questions in the zero minutes we have left? <laughs> okay. Thanks. You've been a great audience. And, oh, there are prizes down here. Somebody come grab some or I'll throw them at you. <laughs>